Uh, my name is Mary Kinwa. Greetings from Kenya. I'm the Fair Trade Chair of Africa, and I have the honor of representing 1.7 million fair trade farmers and workers around the world. Our meeting today comes in the backdrop of two major hurricanes that have devastated Central America in the last one month. The farmers of fair trade who I work with and who I represent have seen their crops of coffee, cocoa, honey, and vegetables in Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua be completely devastated. So as a matter of justice and a matter of science action, the matter of climate crisis cannot be delayed any longer. There is hope. More and more companies are talking to us about how they want us to reduce emissions and reach net zero. But we're not going fast enough. Change by 2050 is too late. The weather is changing now. Doing this properly means helping farmers and workers with the cost of switching to low carbon production and transport. And that cannot happen if we're not prepared to pay for it. We cannot expect, and it is not fair, to expect producers to absorb the cost of more sustainable methods of farming when they're not even able to earn a living income or a living wage because the price they receive for their produce is far too low. This needs to change, and it needs to change fast. So governments need to act to make this happen. So here is your challenge from the world's farmer. Will you work now, harder than ever, to bring down supply chain emotions, to set targets, and to take steps to support, and if need be, compel businesses to decarbonize their supply chain. At today's ambition summit, and the work we will do together over the next one year, we hope will result in co-op that puts us firmly on the path to net zero. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our event with photographer Sean Hawkey. Um, I hope you're all well. Um, just a few things. We're going to be recording uh, tonight's event so that you can watch it later, and um, the people that couldn't make it can also watch it as well. Um, if you don't want to be seen, you can uh, mute yourselves and uh, turn your cameras off. Um, if you have any questions for Sean, you can put them in the chat um, and I'll try and put them, to, oh, he'll be able to see them, but I'll be able to try and put them to him as we go along. Um, you might find it easiest if you switch to speak of you, because then you'll be able to see all the amazing images that Sean's going to be sharing with us. Um, and the other important thing we have to tell you is that we have 10 copies of Sean's book to give away throughout the course of the evening. Um, so what, we, what Sean's going to do is um, there are basically 10 points at which he's going to be asking you a question. Um, if you put the answer to the question in the chat box, I will contact you and ask you for your, your address if you're a winner and then we'll get them out to you as soon as we can. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Sean Hawkey. unmuting myself and let's see I'll, I'll, I'll just introduce myself quickly and before I go on to the um, pictures thanks everyone for coming there's a great group of you I can see um, I'm a, a documentary photographer a news photographer and I've worked uh, on and off for 30 years in Central America so most of what I'm going to talk about this evening is about Central America what was asked to talk about really and I've, I've is is mainly about climate change so it's not the most cheerful subject and i'm glad that you haven't turned your cameras off because when i when i see you start crying then i'll move on to something um a little bit more cheerful um there are not a lot of upsides to climate change apart from the possibility of real yorkshire tea i understand but, that you would be able to grow that in yorkshire and um so i'll i'll get on with the pictures now i'll share the screen so, I um, mean, the, the first, have I shared the screen, Joanna? Great. Um, so, I'm a, I've always liked uh, doing a bit of gardening, allotment, and growing my vegetables and everything. And, and really, before we go to Central America, and I, so I imagine a, a number of you will also, you know, have a garden, maybe an allotment. We're already seeing climate change here. I mean, year after year, we break all the records for the hottest summer 
ever. And um, we're seeing uh, early flowering, we're seeing late frosts, we're seeing irregular rainfall. We don't know when the rain's coming, it's all unpredictable. Um, and long heat waves that uh, more and more frequently. And so, you know, even as a gardener here, as a sort of amateur allotment here and gardener here, you have to start making some quite big adjustments. And maybe instead of planting all in one go, plant uh, now and then plant in two weeks time so that you've got a sort of backup in case the first lot goes and that sort of thing. There'll be new diseases um, as, if we get milder winters, then there'll be, you know, bugs in the soil and diseases in the soil that would normally be knocked out by a very cold winter. But if it's not very cold, they'll survive and then we'll be dealing with um, you know, uh, some sort of plague of it in the, in the next year, you know. So uh, what I'm about to talk about now in, in, in Central America and other countries is it's so much more uh, in, intense than what we've, what am I, let me see. So um, this is a couple of years ago. There was a big migrant caravan came out of uh, Honduras, El Salvador, mainly Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. That's what they call the Northern Triangle of, of Central America. And I went with this particular caravan. We traveled about four and a half thousand kilometers. So from Honduras all the way up to the US border, um, which is a hostile border. And it was a dangerous trip for a lot of people. Um, there are 100,000 kidnappings each year in Mexico. Everybody knows that it's a dangerous place to go through. A lot of people disappear on the, on the journey and so on. The real question is, you know, um, why are people leaving? What's the motor? What's pushing them to leave in such large numbers? And this was a couple of years ago. Since then, there have been at least another 10 caravans. There was one the other day. There's, there's another one in March. Um, and every single day, apart from these large groups of people moving, there are hundreds of people who go uh, in very small groups or as individuals. So, um, you know, what's driving them? And this is people trying to get a, a lift in a, in a truck in, uh, in Mexico on one of those caravans. Um, the, the answer, one of the answers is, this, it's, it's, it's complex, of course, there's a political situation. Um, but climate change is a big thing. Um, very poor trade deals is another thing that all, all of the producers have been squeezed uh, very badly. And uh, there, you know, there's a crisis at the moment in, in coffee prices, that the coffee prices, unless you're a fair trade producer and you get a better price, the coffee, the international coffee price doesn't cover your cost of production. So then you have to cut back very severely in your costs of production and your quality goes down and your yield goes down um, just in order to be able to sell what's what's growing on your bushes and um, it's a real crisis the international organization on migration they say that there's a correlation between the climate crisis violence and migration so what happens in a community when food runs out because they're not getting harvests anymore um, well, it's actually what happens in a family when there's not enough food for everybody in the family. And, I, and I, I've seen this. Um, it's really not nice. Very nasty decisions have to be taken. And there's a sort of, you get a more sort of brutal uh, dog eat dog atmosphere appears in, in communities. And that's actually what's happening in, in Central America at the moment. I've put this in, it's, it's from Somalia, it's not from Honduras, but on Tuesday, the World Food Programme. Um, put out uh, an appeal for Central America because 1.6 million people are already in um, emergency crisis, is, I think is what the, the term that they, they use. And they think that within another month, there'll be 2.6 million people in urgent need of uh, food relief. So they're appealing for $50 million to the international community to because Central America is already in this massive crisis that's very largely due to uh, climate change. So I'm gonna skip through some of these pictures. Um, this is Southern Honduras, um, Choluteca. This is the Rio Chiquito, or it used to be. Um, so when the rivers are completely dried up, you know that all the agricultural land in that area is also suffering. 
And so the green, you'll see there'll be trees that have got very deep roots, but for normal agriculture, um, you're, you're talking about annual crops like beans and maize, um, which are the staple in, in Central America. And they're really struggling there with that. Um, you have to remember that all of the, um, the vast majority of coffee and cocoa producers in Central America will also be uh, growing their own food. So they grow coffee and cocoa for a bit of income, but they grow their own food uh, alongside it. And uh, in the last few years, they've been losing both. So in this particular area where this picture is, Choloteca, there are people who haven't had a harvest for nine years, 10 years. Um, and so you've got youngsters, if you can imagine it, um, you know, kids in their late teens who don't even remember a harvest. So what, what's their mindset? What are they thinking about for the future? It's not agriculture. And so lots of young people um, uh, are in this uh, difficult situation. Crime becomes more appealing to them. Um, after a few years without harvest, lots of these families move away and they, because they're poor. The land is unsellable now. Nobody wants to buy it. Um, they'll move to the marginal areas around the big cities, the, the capital cities, they will see Galpa or San Pedro Sula, and they, those areas are prone to a, a lot of criminal activity. So it's not a, a pretty picture. This is the Rio Grande in, um, this is the center, you know, this is the riverbed of the Rio Grande in Nicaragua. Um, this is Istoca in, in Southern Honduras. Um, these are all different rivers. This is the, the Rio Choloteca, which was a sort of mighty river at one point. Um, this is in Pueblo Nuevo in, in Nicaragua. So even the small rivers are, are gone. This is Rio Coco in Nicaragua, which at this particular point in the river was still a navigable river 10 years ago. And now it's reduced to a stream. Um, also, uh, this is San Francisco Libre in Nicaragua. This is near Managua in Nicaragua. Um, so you, 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 you get in a picture, and I, I sometimes meet people, uh, particularly Americans, who say, yeah, but is it real? And well, yeah, it's, it's actually happening. Yeah. Um, you know, even my um, potatoes and onions and carrots in my garden are affected, but uh, people across the world are suffering much more severely than, than we are. This guy uh, is in Southern Honduras, and he's part of a sort of new, uh, is a new profession of people who are deepening wells because the water level is dropping so fast that, um, and there's no, in huge areas of Honduras, there's no clean water supply by pipe. So water's by, through wells and a village might have 20 wells that gradually they end up with three or two or one well that is operational. They may have to deepen that well as the water level drops, they may have to deepen wells multiple times. And then I've seen various communities that uh, actually weld a, a metal top, a metal gate on top of the well so that people can't, so that they can effectively ration the water in the communities. Um, forests are drying with, I mean, the, the Yorkshire Moors were on, on fire last year, but across the world, we've seen Australia, the United States. This is in Guatemala, right next door to Asobagri, which is a, a large coffee producing co-op. Um, they're, they're a tinderbox and a spark sets them off and you get a massive uncontrollable fire. So the prolonged droughts across Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, um, the cattle, I've got nothing to eat because there's no grass to eat. And so the animals become very weak. So they spend a lot of time on the ground and on the ground and they get sores. And to, uh, to stop the sores getting um, infected, the farmers put iodine on, which is what these purple patches on this cow are. But a, a lot of cattle in the, in the south is already unviable for cattle in, the, in, in, in that what they call the dry corridor. Um, and if they don't take action on time, this is what uh, happens. Lots of farmers have brought their cattle out to higher grounds to better pastures. Um, and then 
after two or three years of, of this sort of drought, uh, no crops, unviable for raising cattle, um, the only thing that they've got that's sellable for cash is to chop down the trees and sell that for firewood. And then once the trees have gone, you've pretty much got a, uh, a permanent arid zone or a desert that is difficult to recover. If you, if you keep some trees on it, um, and these are these here in, in this photograph, they're trees that um, are particularly resistant to, to uh, drought conditions. But once they're gone, it's just desert. So uh, another part of the extreme uh, weather that you get with uh, climate change is um, storms. So you'll have a, a, a long period of drought and then you'll have torrential rain. Or in, this is from Honduras from November, um, two hurricanes. And, and the, the video that we saw mentioned this, two hurricanes hit within two weeks, Hurricane Eta and Hurricane Iota. And this is the main road going between the in main industrial city and the capital city. Um, and you can see the farmland around it. And that was like that for between two and three weeks in huge areas of the country. So um, housing is very badly affected by climate change. Um, this is Chamalecong in San Pedro Sula, which is the, the biggest city. Um, lots of housing was underwater for two or three weeks like this. And so all people's belongings, um, their beds were ruined, their furniture, you know, other furniture was ruined if they had a fridge or a cooker that was ruined. Um, and many of the houses, as, as well as the water, also had a, a lot of silt, particularly if they were near rivers or, or something, and some houses were pretty much completely covered by silt. Um, so these fellows, uh, they were sitting where their house used to be in the, the week before, that's where they lived. Um, so as a, as a climate change is having a huge impact on infrastructure and housing, uh, 200 bridges across the region were affected by these last two hurricanes. Um, most of the roads were washed away in some, some part or another. This is Chamalikong again. This is a, a residential area completely destroyed by the hurricanes. Um, and, and that's the sort of dramatic, immediately visible impact of, the, of, of extreme weather, the, the damage that the storms do. Um, and this is a a main road. This is a bridge across the main road. So I went to see a number of uh, fair trade uh, co-ops in Santa Barbara in Honduras. We spent two days like this, um, completely stuck in, in the mud. So this has affected farmers really dramatically in that they're unable to get machinery into their own farms to repair things. They're unable to get crops out. Um, and it means that crops are being lost, their harvests are being lost. There's not even any point in paying for people to pick it if they can't get the harvests out. So uh, the crops that have survived, uh, I've got trouble. Um, one day we got stuck and they sent a bulldozer to get us out and then the bulldozer got stuck and broke down. And so we were another two days behind this bulldozer. So um, that's sort of fairly typical in the rural areas of Copang, Santa Barbara, or Lancho. Um, the damage to crops was pretty massive. So crops that have been underwater for two weeks, um, they're completely gone. Um, and the roots rot away. This was a pretty typical scene across the country. And then um, these are beans. These are beans that in the pod had sprouted they weren't submerged, but the, the amount of rainfall was so intense, the humidity was so high, that all of the beans across uh, sort of whole county areas of, of Copang, Santa Barbara, um, Ocotepeque, uh, all, of the, all of the beans sprouted. And this is maize, sweet corn, also sprouted across a massive area. So this is the real crisis that, apart from the, the obvious visible things, there's an invisible crisis which is just beginning to bite, which is hunger. And that's why the World Food Programme on Tuesday put out their appeal 
because people are just finishing fi finishing up the last stores of basic grains that they had and they're going on to nothing. Um, the, the unpredictable rains, this I took a, a few years ago now, but um, the, the rain comes late. When it comes, it's too much or it's not enough. Um, the things that the plants sprout, they get to a, a point where they're beginning to lay down the, the fruit on the, the grains on the, uh, on the stem, and then it stops raining. So the, the disruption of, uh, the, of the climate, even if the same amount falls each year, is falling at the wrong times, and people can't predict when the right time is to plant. Um, so now a bit more onto fair trade. The coffee production across the region was very badly affected by these storms. Um, lots of, of coffee uh, fell to the ground under torrential rain. And so this is just one example of this. You can also see the, the grains are suffering from rot. Um, they, they, they've gone black and it's, they, they call this culo negro, black ass, they call it. So it's all, it rots away with the humidity actually on the on the branch so a, a lot of dropped um uh, coffee cherry uh, there were just in santa barbara there were more more than ten thousand landslides so this is a coffee farm you can see the coffee growing up alongside it um this is a, a coffee farmer had 14 landslides just on his farm so everything that was on that is is gone if he decides to replant it, you have to wait at least three years before there's a harvest. But probably it, it, it's been left in such poor conditions that what's left is it's not top, there's no topsoil there. So it's subsoil that's not suitable to plant in. So in most cases, those landslides have, uh, they've just lost land. Um, so that represents a, a huge loss of income and potential income um, for the for the farmers. This is another one. I, um, this day we we drove across a very precarious um, mountain road, and then there was a landslide behind us. The landslides went on for weeks and weeks. There was a landslide behind us, and we couldn't get out, so we had to stay there. Um, but these are farmers who are unable to get their harvest out, the coffee trees that you see in the background, um, they won't even have it picked. Another landslide. Um, this was the main road that goes between the big coffee growing area and the city, impossible to get the trucks across it, and still in danger of further landslides there. Um, what was interesting, I went to one huge landslide in a place called La Reina, Santa Barbara, 280 houses went underneath the mud. And I was the first journalist to arrive there. And when I looked in the crowd, I recognized some of the people in the crowd. The first people responding to the survivors of the landslide was a fair trade cooperative, Quagrixal, uh, who brought in uh, clothes and food in, and, uh, they, and bedding. And they set up uh, about 500 people who escaped. They'd, set them up in local schools. And this was one of the schools. So um, there's a really good, strong social conscience and, and uh, immediate response from the, 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 the coffee co-ops in the, in the area. So this is um, another aspect of the, of the weather is that's longer term than the, than the immediate damage that's done is when, when you get half a degree increase in temperature, you get a 7% increase in humidity. So this is a, a long-term problem. It's not just the, the hurricanes. And the humidity, uh, the fungal plant diseases love it. Fungal infections love it. So um, this is a healthy plant on the left. And then you can see a leaf that's affected by leaf rust in the middle and a plant that's been affected by leaf rust on the right. This has been doing damage now for well over 10 years. And farms that get affected by this, once, once the fungus gets in, it's impossible to get rid of it or to treat it with antifungals. So whole farms have to be cut down and replanted. Replanting is, is very expensive. 
you have the nursery costs, the young plant costs, you've got a lot of labor costs to replant. You probably want fertilizers in there for, for the trees to work and so on. And um, then you've got to wait three years. So you've got a, a three year wait before you see the beginning, the first harvest, which is always a small harvest, four years before you see a proper harvest. So the cost of replanting are huge. And then what they'll do is they'll, there's a lot of research going on to find varieties of coffee that are more re resistant to uh, fungal infections. Um, so this leaf tree rust, La Roya, they, they call it, is particularly bad, but there, there's another dozen uh, fungal diseases that are affecting, uh, affecting coffee right across the region. And that coupled with the very bad trade deals that there are and the international coffee price, they, they don't, they're not making enough, uh, the, you know, the, the coffee price doesn't cover the, cover the cost of production. So a little bit about bananas. Um, I've done a lot of work in Ecuador and Peru on, on fair trade bananas. Um, most of the production comes out of southern Ecuador and northern uh, Peru. Colombia is also a big producer. Dominican Republic is also a big producer. And at the moment, they're all waiting on, a, on another fungal disease. That's, they call it TR4, um, uh, tropical race four, which is a strain of Fusarium, which is uh, otherwise known as Panama disease. And Panama disease, uh, a couple of decades ago, completely wiped out the uh, bananas worldwide. It's already causing massive devastation to bananas across Asia and um, Pacific regions of Australia and New Zealand. Um, and Cavendish banana, uh, which is basically what they they grow in, it's more than 50% of the world banana production is Cavendish. So Ecuador and Peru, it's almost all Cavendish. There's almost nothing else, apart from in some mountainous regions that they'll do uh, other varieties. There are, I, I think, well over a thousand varieties of, of, of banana, but the ones that are viable uh, commercially um, are, are limited. Um, and because Cavendish is grown from the corn, from um, it's uh, basically a clone that's all grown from one plant. So every Cavendish uh, banana plant in the world has all come from the same plant, they're like clones. And so they're all uh, affected in exactly the same way by this Fusarium, by TR4. So they're bracing at the moment in Ecuador for massive devastation. There's already uh, examples of it in uh, Colombia, which is next door. And so they've braced and with the help of fair trade uh, technical assistance and, and fair trade technicians, um, there are thousands of them um, are, are working on this, how to isolate it. When it does arrive, how you isolate it. And a, a new measure that's been put in in every single farm is your shoes have to be disinfected with something that kills Fusarium, the TR4, as you go in and as you go out on every farm. And uh, the tires of every truck are sprayed in and out. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot going on. Or well, this is a, in Ecuador, they also recycle all of their plastic. The banana industry uses a lot of plastic to protect bananas and they recycle it all and then reuse it on their own farms. We'll go quickly to cocoa. This is uh, cocoa, I don't know what you call it, pulp, I suppose, because it comes straight out of the uh, pods. Um, cocoa is also very badly affected. This is Ivory Coast. Um, Ivory Coast used to have massive production all the way up into the north of the country, but climate change is bringing arid conditions further and further south. And so the north is becoming unviable by and large for cocoa production. Um, and it's also affecting food production. So uh, again, there's, there's a huge migration out of West Africa. Um, and we are just seeing the very beginning of this. I've, I've been to six of the, I've covered six of the UN climate conferences um, and listening to climate scientists for a couple of weeks speak um, is pretty harrowing and, and dreadful. There, there isn't an optimistic uh, opinion in, in the house and the conferences normally have about 10,000 people in them. 
and not a single optimist among them um, in terms of how we're going to get out of this unscathed. We're facing a massive uh, crisis. This is the beginning of it. And we're going to be reaching tipping points in the, in the near future that you can't come back from. Um, this is a Ivory Coast, again, uh, an area that's badly affected. So fair trade um, is, uh, this is Quagri Sal in, in Honduras. Um, with all of this disaster, you know, the, the leaf rust, um, bad weather, low international price, their vision was, oh, we have to help all of our members, all our co-op members diversify. And we also have to do something to improve the climate and to secure the land. A lot of land that suffered landslides because uh, mountainous steep slopes are great for growing coffee, um, are prone to landslides. The good way to secure them is putting deep rooted shade trees in. So Quagrixal uh, and, and several of the, the cops that I visited recently had done projects of 20,000 trees. They planted 20,000, 50,000 trees. When I got to Quagrixal, they said, yeah, we, we took this a bit more seriously. One and a half million trees they planted. And so this is one of their um, nurseries where they did uh, over a million cocoa trees. And, and cocoa doesn't grow on twigs. It doesn't grow on little branches. It grows on the, you know, on the trunks of trees. It grows on on. Uh, big parts of trees so you need to have big trees so they've planted uh 1.2 million to date i think 1.2 million cocoa trees and 300,000 shade trees because cocoa needs a lot of shade to 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 get optimum production um so there are lots of little projects like that there are thousands of technicians employed by fair trade uh, certified co-ops um they're working on diversification they're working on adaptation, they're working on resilience, they're working on biodiversity, they're setting up um, small uh, reforestation programs, they're setting up shade reforestation programs. This is another shot from another year of the, um, of, of the nurseries, the tree nurseries. And they're training young people all over um, the region. This is uh, cocoa training uh, and the taking young people. Of course, fair trade is, is very well known for, um, it, it, for giving uh, better remuneration for the work that's done, but it, it also does fantastic work on education and it does fantastic work, work on healthcare. Um, I was just on a previous call where uh, the head of a co-op, a woman, was saying investing in fair trade is actually investing in health because of the amount of work that we're, they're doing on organic uh, production. Uh, how their level of disease that comes from chemicals is going down. And her own father had died from exposure to chemicals and uh, uh, cancer related to exposure to chemicals. So this is training in Waslala in, in Nicaragua. And as I visit co-ops time to time, it's very common for me to find that the, there's a training going on. So just, I mean, that's a sort of... Uh, it's not a particularly cheerful view of what's going on, but it's a, perhaps a... Um, a fairly realistic view of what's going on. Um, and back home, uh, just a, a, apart from, you know, you're in, when you buy fair trade products, you are investing in the environment. It's, it's one of the things that doesn't say it on the tin, fair trade. It's talking, uh, fair, fair trade, the name of it, you know, the, the idea that most people have in their head about it is this is just giving a better price to the farmers. Actually, it's huge investment in education and health and the environment. And what, what it really does uh, very well, uh, in, and it's been doing it for a long time, is um, helping farmers adapt to a rapidly changing and dangerous climate situation. So I'm glad to see here I've covered all sorts of Extinction Rebellion things and uh, Fridays for Future and, and that sort of thing. I'm really glad to see uh, people of all ages engaging in that. Um, and particularly younger people who have been put off of politics and, and sort of engaging in social issues, I think, over, over recent years. It's good to see young people engaging in this and how they understand it. And I think on a, 
this is a final s slide here, uh, a, a boring one, the, the climate change negotiations. Um, we're going to have, we're, we're the host of the next uh, COP, the Conference of Parties. Um, I think it's a good idea to engage with your local politicians and e express uh, your views to them on how urgent it is to take action on climate change. So, oh, I for totally forgot to do the questions. So um, I see Joanna laughing there. I'm gonna unshare this if I can. Um, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. How, how can we redo, Joanna, that, uh, the distribution of your, of, of the books? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the book. Um, I've done a couple of books on, uh, and the most recent one is called Faces of Fair Trade. I did it in, in collaboration with, with Fair Trade. Some of the pictures that you've seen here and a lot more cheerful ones of um, fair trade producers around the world on all sorts of different, not just coffee and cocoa, but um, vegetables and honey and nuts and other things. Um, all sorts of uh, photos from across the world are uh, in the book. Joanna has a few copies to give away, um, and you can you can also get them from Big Green Books, who Joanna recommended to me as a uh, as a distributor. So uh, back to Joanna. I don't know how you want to. Yeah. Well, I think what I think probably the best thing to do um, is I'm going to ask you a fairly simple question. So can you just name one of the crops that's affected by climate change that you've seen in the uh, presentation this evening? And then I'm going to pick just 10 random people, get their addresses um, and I'll send out the, the prizes to you. So um, it's not just the book. We'll, we'll also send you a few little extra things as well. Um, and I can see lots of people answering all correct so far. Very good. Um, so, yeah. Um, Sean, uh, while I'm trying to pick some winners, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your next project? Because I think that's something to do with, um, similar to what we saw at the beginning, something to do with migration. Is that right? Uh, I've done a lot on migration over the years, and um, I'm doing a documentary on migration. Um, it's in three parts. Um, first of all, looking at what the motors of migration are, um, and it includes political instability, climate change, violence. Um, then looking at the journey. So I'll be accompanying more migrants as they go from uh, Central America up to the US border. And then looking at what new uh, Biden politics, you know, comparing the Trump politics and Biden politics, what's the, the new situation on the border? And it's I'm going to sort of present the whole thing as a guide for migrants, how to be a wetback migrant um, and basically how, how to do it and particularly how not to do it, because uh, there's a lot of people who are sort of unfamiliar with the dangers that they're exposing themselves to. So the idea is to educate people about the dangers that there are on the journey and how to avoid them. So it's a. Uh, it's a one hour documentary, it'll probably take me about three months to film. So I'm looking forward, as soon as I get a jab in my arm, I'll be off to that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to, if anybody's got any questions or comments or anything, I'd be very happy to um, I, I don't chat. To, well, I'm contacting people. I don't know if you want to have a quick look in the chat because one or two, oh yes, Ellen has got a question. In your experience on the ground, did you come across farmers who were excluded from fair trade certification because they were unable to meet the required standards? And did you find it was inclusive enough? That's a really good question. Well, fair trade can only operate if it's got standards. Um, it can't just take anybody and give them a better price. So um, if people can't come up to those standards, if they don't meet those criteria, then they can either be uh, not allowed in or they can be suspended, temporarily excluded. Um, and I think that's the only way that it can work. Um, and there are particular standards on um, how workers are treated because um, you know, most farms will be of a size that at least in uh, you know, temporarily in harvest and so on, they'll need to bring on staff. So how are their, how are their workers treated? Um, you have to come up to a particular standard. You have to 
um, give them health and safety, um, you know, PPE, if they're going to be using anything dangerous. Um, so there are there are standards, environmental standards, that you want them to, to come up to. And uh, fair trade has got a sort of network of auditors who it, they're independent; they're not part of fair trade, but they use these auditors to check that people are coming up to uh, standards. So I wouldn't say that I've ever met any anybody who feels, and it's it's expensive to come up to standard for for a producer, a, a very small uh, production outfit, a very small co-op may not find that they're going to get any return on that investment because the investment to become certified is actually quite big. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I've ever met anybody who uh, was sort of felt that they've been excluded. Um, people are excluded if they're not coming up to standard, but it's not, not really a matter of uh, will, it's just a matter of having to enforce standards. I don't know if that answers the question well, but I hope so. Good. I, I, I can see Rennie here saying that they've met the MP twice. Fantastic. I think they have to feel a bit of pressure. Um, they, they're, you know, pretty ignorant by and large. Um, there, there are a few enlightened people. Um, our MP in Brighton here is the only green MP in the country, she's fairly enlightened, but um, most don't realize how severe it is and how severe it's going to be. Some of the predictions from scientists who've never been wrong um, are really alarming, really, really alarming. Any advice on getting into the genre of photography? Um, don't do it. It's the first one. Um, it's the, the the business of photography has changed a lot over uh, over the last decade, and it's not even really a viable um, profession anymore. Um, everybody's got a camera. No, there's no there's no money for photography, so you, you have to do a bit of everything. But environmental photography is obviously it's a vocation it's a commitment so I'd, I'd encourage you to do it and um you'll be in good company with lots of other impoverished photographers yeah um yeah is this is this recorded joanna Yes, so yeah, we are recording it. Um, everything, all the, all the events in our festival are, are being recorded. Um, so they're available to watch again. Um, it'll be obviously tomorrow now because I'll have to upload them. Um, so either via the Fairtrade Yorkshire face, um, the YouTube channel, um, but also in the, the Choose the World You Want festival website, the dedicated Fair, uh, Fair Trade Festival website. You, if you click on that, you go to on demand recordings of all of the events that have happened um, and uh, basically everything in the whole festival you'll be able to see. So there's all sorts of things from Lucy Siegel's event on Monday and the cook alongs that were that uh, Melissa Helmsley have been doing and the, the co op wine tasting from last night as well. You can watch that online. Um, and uh, the, some of the people here might. Might, might, may not have been able to get into the event that we did with Hadil on Monday. You can watch that online as well. Um, so yeah, basically all of the events are recorded um, and you can watch them back. That's uh, that's fine. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, I'll just come back quickly. Sue James has, said, has, has used the term climate heating. That's exactly what it is. It's not warming, it's, it's heating. That's a very good point. Um, Helen Robinson, is there evidence that all the tree planting techniques are impacting positively on farmer harvests. Um, well, for, for coffee and cocoa, they need a certain amount of uh, shade in order to improve the quality. So it, it always improves the quality up to a certain point. Um, if it's too shaded, of course, nothing's going to grow. But um, so there's first of all, there's that positive impact on the on the farmer's crops, the quality uh, and yield of their crops. Secondly it's clear in very steep areas that are prone to landslides. There are fewer landslides where there are more trees planted. So lots of farmers like to get a, a, a double crop. So they'll have coffee, but they'll shade it with banana because um, there's a pretty good trade, for example, from Honduras selling bananas to 
um, Guatemala at the moment. Um, and so instead of using trees, they'll use banana, but banana hasn't got any deep roots and uh, it will provide a bit of shade and it's, it's great temporarily, but um, it's really clear that, that there were mar far more um, landslides on farms that were using banana as, uh, as shade instead of trees. So the more trees uh, are planted, the more safe the, the soil. So um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think the weather's getting so extreme that even on some farms that were planted with trees, the whole lot went, um, but generally uh, very positive. And we know now that we're meant, we should be planting a trillion trees as a sort of uh, carbon acquisition technique. Um, so the more trees we plant for the climate, the better. Are there any particular organizations um, responsible for underpaying of coffee farmers? Well, yeah, I, I think, yeah, we don't want to inadvertently support uh, companies that are exploiting farmers. It's, they're already at, in, in a terrible crisis point. When I went on that uh, caravan through Mexico, every day I was meeting new people. Lots and lots of landless farmers, landless laborers, farm workers, um, who'd been working on coffee and then uh, the, the prices for the, the um, farms were paying the laborers was, was dropping. And in lots of areas, the, the work just disappeared. It dried up, literally dried up. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I can't, I can't name the, you know, I think all the big ones are. Uh, Is it Nestle? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's been said. But I'm sure that there are plenty, you know, yeah. So, but, but, you know. Most people know I have like. Nestle. <laughs> Will human ingenuity come up with some solutions? I think the, techn the technological solutions are there. We're just unwilling to, um, to use them. You know, um, we, we need a rapid transition away from fossil fuels to renewables. We need to change the way we live. We need a massive reduction in, in energy use. Um, and you know, the, the, there's a really simple carbon capture technology out there. It's trees. Or we've got to plant them when we're not doing it. Um, I haven't written about the, there's another question here, have I written about the migrant caravan? I've done a few articles that might be uh, available if you sort of do a Google search or something. Um, thanks very much everyone for the positive comments. I, I'm sorry to have depressed you all. I can see that there's a, but, uh, I've, I've got another about question. The future of the planet. We're, we're at a, a critical point, and if we, you know, I, I, I suspect we're unable to do it. It's just, we're not very good at dealing with things on this scale. Democracy actually probably won't help us in the United Nations to see uh, uh, nearly 200 countries discussing things and talking to lots of the negotiators and representatives and they're completely powerless. They feel powerless to do things. Um, the democratic process actually interferes with a clear, authoritative, urgent and immediate decision being taken, right? You know, phase out fossil fuels now, you know, uh, stop building new coal uh, power plants, for goodness sake. Um, so, yeah, I've got mixed feelings. Um, some scientists are saying, enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. And um, <laughs> I, I don't have a particularly, I'm sorry to say this, a particularly optimistic view of, of where we're going. And it may be that some scientists' predictions of you know, we'll have a massive decrease in the global population within the next 20 years. It, it seems like that's quite a viable possibility, yeah. Yeah, we do need to pay even, um, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the fantastic work that fair trade does, but even with all the fantastic work that it does, you still see a lot of farmers within the fair trade system who are actually quite poor. 
actually very poor. Um, and yes, we do need to pay more for our coffee. We need a, a, a greater international coffee coffee price. Um, uh, but you know, fair trade is as good as it gets. Um, was was uh, there was a there was a question on a previous talk that I was on. What's best, fair trade or um, the the rainforest uh, alliance? Um, far away, it's fair trade. Far away, yeah. Um, I've had so, a, another question just privately to me, I think that by accident. Uh, so Elizabeth's asking, what's the attitude of the producers? Are they frustrated and annoyed at the countries that are actually causing climate change? Or are they resigned and sanguine about what's happening to them? Yeah, I, I, I think in any climate change negotiation, those sort of issues are, are very clear. And people talk about climate justice and what they mean is, it's not a very clear term, what they mean is, you know, the industrialized nations by emitting, uh, by causing so much emissions with coal-fired industrialization, basically, you know, fossil fuel, um, we've caused the problem and yet we're experiencing less of the problem. So we should be forking out to help um, other countries through the, the problems and, and help them to transition and, and that sort of thing, rather than saying, you're not allowed to do it. You can't have your industrialization, that's just us. So we do need, you know, the climate justice issues are, are, are entirely clear, but on a farmer level, most farmers wouldn't be aware of the details, of those sort of discussions that would happen on a, you know, a climate change UN uh, COP or something like that. Is there recent detailed research? I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that. Fair Trade Foundation would, or Fair Trade International would have that sort of thing. Um, could you use your skills to create stories to engage people? That's what I try to do. Yeah. Um, it's, it's harder and harder. I used to have more easy access to media like The Guardian um, uh, and other newspapers that were keen it's getting harder and harder. I did a big story actually not long ago on the on the migrant caravan for The Guardian that The Guardian asked me to do um, 20 pictures and two and a half thousand words. And, uh, you know, that's a big story for, for a newspaper, but they're so understaffed. They've had their staff cut back so much, it couldn't get through the sub edit because they didn't have any sub editors. And so it just never got published. Um, so even though you've got willing, there are sort of restrictions uh, now on, um, on a lot of media that uh, stop the story getting out in any way except through perhaps alternative media or, um, you know, special interest networks like fair trade networks. I'm really glad to see such a great audience uh, for fair trade Yorkshire. It's, it's terrific. And it shows the importance of, of um, running and sustaining and, and feeding networks like this um, because a lot of this information just won't get out any other way. Thanks that's absolutely fantastic we're coming to the end um, so I think we've we've tackled most of your questions I've put in the chat box uh, the link to the, the latest report from Fairtrade um, it basically links you to the Fairtrade website and then you can download the new report so that's in, in re response to Chris's question about the recent detailed research that's the latest report that's come out and it looks at lots of things around climate change and around fair trade so I'd urge you to have a look at that as I say it's on the fair trade Yorkshire web uh, on the, the fair trade foundation's website um, I just googled new report fair trade and it came straight up so um, it's worth having a look at that um, thank you very much Sean it's been absolutely fascinating um, I'm just going to put one other link there for the people who didn't get a free book. There's the, yes. uh, you, can get, yes. you can get my books there. Please do buy from the Big Green Bookshop. Um, Simon's absolutely brilliant. He used to run a little uh, bookshop um, in London and he got into all sorts of difficulties because you know what independent retail's like. Um, and so what he did was he moved down to the South Coast uh, to Hastings with his family and he's been running the Big Green Bookshop basically on Twitter. It's, it's, it's a good job it's Wednesday actually uh, because Wednesday with the Big Green Book Group 
the bookshop is always buy a stranger a book day so the 10 people who are going to get these free books from us are, te are inadvertently taking part in simon's um uh, fantastic uh, idea so the, the whole point about buy a stranger a book day is that um, you basically treat somebody to a book that they want. Um, and it's a lovely idea. So follow him on Twitter, get involved. And if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not been lucky enough to buy one of the books from Sean, um, I'll be giving them away at some of the other events as well. But if you don't want to risk it and you want to get this fantastic book, then get in touch with the Simon at the Big Green Bookshop. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, I'm going to show a, a lovely video of some of the other faces of fair trade. And this has come from uh, a BAFTS member called Artisan International, and they work in Ecuador. They work with people with disabilities in Ecuador. So I'm gonna share this video um, just as a sort of final um, ending to this fantastic evening. And I'm sure quite a lot of you are planning to go away, get a cup of tea and then come back at 7.30 uh, for the wonderful event with Adjuarando. Bueno, yo antes de quedar inválido en silla de ruedas, era una persona normal, tenía mi compromiso, ese compromiso tuve dos niños y bueno, ahí me, mi accidente fue que levanté demasiado peso, se me dio la columna y tuvieron que operarme y, y quedé así. De ahí vine a conocer a, a las personas como él, como Ramón, este, Steven y bueno yo de aquí de mi casa después de quedar así no quería salir y ellos vinieron un día y me dijeron no si puede sale y ellos me motivaron bastante y de ahí conocí a, a la primer teacher ¿cómo se llamaba? Yes. Este, ahí conocí a la teacher Jessie, a Andrew, a Francesca que para allá el, este proyecto que es el grupo 3 y para qué proyecto me ha, me ha enseñado bastante y ha cambiado mi vida bastante porque antes no hacía nada, como que ya no quería salir de mi casa y, y no, ahorita tengo mi mente ocupada y no, metiéndole ganas con muchas ganas y, y es bonito, para qué Hola Estoy muy agradecido porque, como les estaba contando, yo soy soldador y en realidad para un soldador en, con discapacidad no es fácil porque mucha gente no confía, no cree que uno sea capaz de eso. Y he tenido así como mis altas, he tenido mis bajas, pero igual la situación no es como la de antes, que antes uno como quiera sobrevivía, ahora ya no. Especialmente yo conocí gracias a Dios una persona que a mí me quiere, me ama, me respeta. Con ella he tenido una hija y ella tenía otra que igual yo la quiero como que si fuera mía. Y esta oportunidad que ustedes nos dan a nosotros es algo que no lo hace cualquiera. Créanme lo que muchas personas han dicho, sí, te vamos a ayudar, sí, te vamos a hacer esto pero son pocos los que en realidad dan la mano sin pedir nada acá y ustedes lo han hecho y de esta manera como ustedes pueden ver o sea hemos puesto en práctica algo nuevo, algo novedoso, algo que no se veía acá 
y más que nada tuvieron la paciencia de Andrew y Jesse enseñarnos, Ramón tener la paciencia de aguantarnos sabiendo nuestro carácter, porque no es fácil, no es fácil estar en una silla de ruedas y decir, sí todo está bien, no es fácil, pero ahora podríamos decir que ya estamos a un paso de decir, sí podemos y todo va a estar bien el día de hoy. I think if there's one thing that we can take away from this evening, it's what Andres was saying, si podemos, yes, we can do this. Um, I think through fair trade, we've really got the opportunity to change things. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks, million thanks to Sean for sharing uh, all of his insights and uh, I'll see you at the next event. Thanks everyone, bye.